if you're any good at all, you know you can be better. Wonderful. There it is. And so if you are being analytical as a director, there's not a single day that goes by in your career, not a single rehearsal that goes by that you're not going to be thinking, okay, what happened and what needs to occur. Welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 98. Here with uh, Rob Westerberg. Rob, how are you? I'm doing great, man. Good. Good to be here. What's this episode all about? I, I was just mentioning to you, and, and it, it is worth repeating. I think it's pretty wonderful if you're talking about a growth mindset as an educator. Uh, you know, the growing band director, I, I take that as the evolving band director, mm -hmm. but really it comes down to, are you an evolving educator? And if you are, then you're looking at all your resources around you. And some of the ones that you have access to are not the ones that you might necessarily think about being right there as a resource. And They're so, in the same building as you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, this is, I, you know, we're going to stick to the topic. This is about the band director and this is about instrumental music, but um, certainly from a, a standpoint, a viewpoint of someone who's not in it every day. And what are the similarities? What yep. can we learn from each other? So when my wife and I first started teaching together in Westbrook, we didn't have kids yet, right? So we had time on our hands. So Rob, Rob was teaching the Portland Community Chorus at the time. Right. right and right. my mom sang in it. And we were like, you know what? We really wanted to sing that choir. You know, it wasn't because we really wanted to sing, right? <laughs> I mean, we were fine with that. No, I'm with but, you. But we had the opportunity to, to like watch you rehearse for a few years. And that was a big compliment that we could pay to you. And the compliment you paid to us was you didn't make us audition. <laughs> <laughs> didn't need to. That was and awesome. I knew it. You were like, oh, you're a band director? You'll be fine. Just come on in. Right? So like, I just, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because you're like the clear, one of the clearest conductors I've ever seen. And I think there's a lot that people can learn from what we're going to discuss today. Mm -hmm. um, I also know you have a reputation. I got to be honest, I haven't seen you teach outside of the time that we spent there, but you have like kind of a band like method to how you teach it. And what's the quote that you told me so many years ago, anybody who teaches choir, you think should teach band first. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, if you want to be a good choral director, watch a great band rehearsal. And, uh, and we can go into it. Yeah, why? My, my hero in choral music is and was Robert Shaw. He passed away, I think, in 2000. Um, it, it, it's not relevant, 2000, I think. Uh, but anyway, Robert Shaw was the king of choral music. He redefined choral music in the United States. And he really thought as an instrumentalist, and he took the approach that it comes from the finest minute details working out. And it tends to be quite opposite of what we see in the choral world, which is, you know, it's all about the feels and think big, and then you get to as much minutia as you possibly can. And I love the fact that instrumentalists by nature are just very, very specific with the work they do, either as an instrumentalist or as a band conductor. So I, I think the Shaw approach mm -hmm. and the instrumental approach mentality um, are very aligned. That's awesome. Um, so we haven't come up with a title for this one yet, but I think we'll we'll workshop something. <laughs> we'll see. Um, all right. So let's start talking about your approach to rehearsals. So mm -hmm. like, let's get into a little bit of a philosophy. I know we. I kind of said let's. I want to be more practical than something that people who watch this can take away yeah. with practical. Yeah. But uh, I think when so I, I I think there's several different problems that we have in this profession. Um, problems meaning challenges. And, and the first is that if you take any 10 music programs, um, you're going to see eight or nine different philosophies and reasons for their existence. Yep. Uh, and, and that's not true in social studies. Mm -hmm. It's not true in math or science. And we as a profession can't land or agree on what the function and purpose of our own programs are. And I don't say that as a negative. That's all right. And there's a lot that's good about that. I think it means we can learn even more from each other. Mm -hmm. But uh, it also means that there's no consensus you know, very little consensus, I think, as to what our form and function is at, in our own programs. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I would say, number one, philosophically, uh, know why you do what you do. The why is far more important than the what. So number one, understanding 
uh, philosophically, why am I doing what I'm doing? If you're clear on that with yourself and with your students, 100% of everything you do is going to flow directly from that. Mm -hmm. It's going to be crystal clear. It's going to be uh, very transparent. And it's all going to feed into each other. So know why your program is there. Um, I so, say, so what are some examples of those whys? Um, a fundamental one, uh, which which I'll talk to my student teachers. So there's a lot of discussion with student teachers that I have that you and I will have because I think that's where there's a lot of transferable information here. Um, are we here to serve the needs of our students or is it the other way around? Mm -hmm. You know, and you have to be really careful with that. Mm -hmm. And if it's about the students, then okay, what are the goals for the students? Do you want to provide the good experience or and or do you want to provide the opportunity for the students to grow as musicians and or do you want them to grow as people and or do you want them to grow in their function in the ensemble all of those are right answers and they can happen concurrently but what are your foundational whys what what's the single most important thing mm -hmm. what's next most what's next most and have it clear in your mind what that is and then you'll never have a problem making decisions in your program because you basically already set up the hierarchy it's like the end goal that's my end goal and if this leads us towards our end goal then i know it's a good decision it's it's edu speak to say backwards design but that's exactly what it is yeah you know know what you want the outcome if i have a student leaving my program after four years and i look at that student and that student looks at me and says this was a successful four years what happened in those four years to make, make it successful mm -hmm. you know and there's no wrong answer to that <laughs> but you better be clear in your mind what the answer is for you and your program and so philosophically let, let's begin with that you know um i think uh, we have to look at, and, th and this then starts to go into where our starting point will be for today in rehearsals. What, what is the function of the rehearsal? Is it to learn literature or to develop the musician? Mm -hmm. And you can do both simultaneously again, but what is the form and function of, of why we're even there? Mm -hmm. um, so before I forget, you mentioned uh, you and Crystal coming into PCC and not having to audition. Yeah. Uh, so if we're talking about the differences between choral singers and uh, instrumentalists, one of the things that I got to do for 15 years was conduct MSYM. So I'll, I'll go back further than that. My first love was not singing, it was trumpet. I loved playing trumpet and I learned more um, being in the Keene State Jazz Ensemble as an undergraduate, then all my choral training combined. I learned more about being a musician, uh, and, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Mm -hmm. But I had a 15 years opportunity to be the choral director at MSYM up in Orono, the senior choir camp. And we had both vocalists, but also instrumentalists in there who, well, I need to fill another slot, or I also sing on the side or mm -hmm. whatever. So they were also in there. Uh, we had sectionals every day, but they weren't true sectionals. What they did was they put all the students who were in musical theater in one section, and then all the students who weren't in musical theater in the other section. So it was SATB in both sections. Invariably, what happened was we had in one all those who just sing. That's all they do. In the other sectional were all the ones who were in symphonic band and concert band. And it was hysterical to watch and to listen because 15 straight years, I don't think there was really any variation on what happened. The vocalists were all excited. They were animated. Uh, they, you know, squirrel. And, and they were like all over the place, so happy to be together. They, they bring were, the drama. They were in this yeah. community, you know, but they weren't really into the reading music thing very much. You know, what key are we in? <laughs> Whatever. I'll hear it. <laughs> Wait, there's a key? Yeah. And then when we got to the instrumental side. Yeah, they're a bunch of clarinet players. They're just... I'm, they were just sitting like this. They were still, they were engaged. They were happy, but they were just sitting there. And they could read like crazy. Uh, and they were asking questions about dynamics. <laughs> so where, where I'm going with this is... Uh, you know, the inside joke, of course, is there's musicians and then there's singers. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so when you and Crystal said, you know, we'd like to audition, like you're in. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so here's another thing I want to make sure I hit is that, I, that you cannot say enough 
about the role of being analytical as a musician, mm -hmm. whether you're a singer or instrumentalist. And I think this is one of the areas where uh, vocalists really need to learn more from the instrumentalists. You have to be analytical by nature to be an instrumentalist. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't play the D on the trumpet unless you know that's the fingering. Mm -hmm. You have to be analytical every single moment you're a musician. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the analytical piece is what I try to do to train my choirs to be. I want them to leave big picture goal. What's the philosophy of your program? I want my students to leave my program being analytical. Think through everything you're doing and know uh, why you're doing something rather mm -hmm. than just, well, it feels good or imagine this or think that. I want you to know physically what's going on and I want you to know all that. So <clears throat> that leads then to rehearsals. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm going to be training students to be analytical, I'm going to use my warm ups primarily for the teaching component and use the literature for the application component. Yep. That's not deep thinking in and of itself, but what we do in rehearsals, um, go back uh, to my statement, working on literature in rehearsal equals warm-ups plus sheet music. So if I find myself teaching a concept in the middle of a song, that's the dot, 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 okay, idiot, you got to go back to the yeah. drawing board and reimagine your warm ups for next class because this should not be taught in the yeah. literature. It has to be applied, whether it be a rhythm or any other concept. Well, I mean, I mean, so as a singer, you're talking, you know, let's let's talk about tone for a second, how tone is everything. Uh, Robert Shaw said, you know, tone is the emotional content of whatever you bring to the table. Uh, and, and if you're reinforcing good tone and warm ups and making that a focal point, then if the tone is going awry in rehearsal, you don't have to stop and say, well, try this, do that. All you're doing is stop and say, no, give me what you gave me in the warm ups. Yeah. Ding. Aha. Uh -huh, got it. It's applied. And I think a lot of, so that's the same in band, right? Tone is if they don't have a great tone, of course, that's there the are people who are rhythm first people too. Um, but the, I think there's a lot of similarities to tone on an instrument and tone vocally, right? So if I were to describe how do I make good tone on, say, a generic wind instrument, a lot of it is tongue position, right? The the inner vowel that you're using with your ins, with your mouth, along with, of course, the embouchure that you're using and, and, and breath support and posture and all that. But like so much of it is the inner of their instrument. So if somebody's new to this and you're listening, you're like, if you went E on your horn and then went O, like that changes the entire sound of the instrument. And then I was like, when I learned that, I was like, that's just like singing. It is. It's like, it's all the same. It is. Uh, the, the thing about being a singer, the, the challenge of being a singer is that as long as you live, that's an instrument you will never be able to see nor touch, mm -hmm. you know, and that's unique to the human voice. So that means you need to be analytical about what's going on technically on the inside when you're singing. Um, one of my things I tell my students all the time is never allow your vowel to determine your tone. Your tone should be consistent whether you're singing an E vowel or an A vowel. Well, there's the transfer over to the instrumental side. One of the things that we may get to is expectations of the rehearsal and expectations of students. I, I swear by student video submissions. Um, where I'm very specific about what I'm going to assess. So for instance, if I give my chamber singers a video assessment uh, due in a few days, I'll say, okay, I'm assessing uh, correct pitch and I'm assessing tone. Just those two things. You're going to get indicators in power school. I'll, I won't put, you know, assessment for week of July 14th. Yeah. What I'll do is I will literally put in the indicator and give an indicator score for that indicator, indicator, score for that indicator. So I'm separating out the, um, the skill set of appropriate pitch versus appropriate tone. You, mm -hmm. could, you could play perfectly or sing every note perfectly with a really rancid tone mm -hmm. and vice versa, by the way. Sure. And, and so when you, when you pick them apart, you're able to really isolate the disciplines. How does that transfer to tone? If you're a band director and you routinely have your students submitting video submissions, and they don't have to be more than 20 seconds long. You can be listening and be very specific where, with where you want the camera angle on them. And you can give them feedback on the tone on their instrument, or you might see something or see some muscles and give them very specific feedback. Uh, one of the things that I found a couple of years ago was a Google, and we use the Google 
stuff at yeah. uh, York High School. Um, one of the things I found was an add-on called Moat, M-O-T-E. And right in Google Classroom, you hit a button and you record yourself giving them feedback. And there are some kids, I'll give them three minutes of feedback. Uh, you try not to make it that long, mm -hmm. very precise, but you're giving them very specific feedback to their specific instrument, their specific video, and giving them ideas for things that they can tweak then during rehearsals. And then a week or two later, let's see if we can make a dent in that. Mm -hmm. uh, the aha moment was I do moat feedback for all my students, but there was, I, it doesn't matter what month it was. It was either at the end of first semester, or beginning of second semester, I gave my students an assessment and I was doing the assessments on a Saturday morning. I love doing that over my morning coffee on Saturdays. Uh, and, and I was like, well, I just, I don't have time to do the moat. So I'll, I'll type in a couple of things or give them the scores. They can learn yep. from the scores. Uh, and the next day, oh my gosh, the chamber singers were all over me, literally all like, where were the moat? We, I was so excited to get the feedback and you didn't give us the feedback. Where's the feedback? And they were on my case for it. So instead of being this thing where, okay, I got to do it. I'll jump through this hoop. They literally are listening to my feedback. And at the end of the year, I had a couple of different students say the most important thing, the most valuable thing to me was the feedback that you gave me in the mode recording. It doesn't have to be a mode recording, but let's talk about feedback. If we're talking about the building blocks of every musician, mm -hmm. let's, we're talking about tone right now for the instrumentalist, then make that a focal point of your warmups and then make it a focal point of your individualized feedback to the students and make it a regular thing because then they're seeing that growth. Mm -hmm. uh, tone is one thing. Um, eyes is another. Ears is another. Um, does it make any sense what I was? Yeah, totally. I think the thing that stops a lot of us from doing all those individualized ones is just time. Oh, for sure. We, we know it's additional time. I would also say this, that if your assessment is 20 seconds long, I can, I can go through a class of 55 kids in under an hour. Mm -hmm. That's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> and it's because what I'm doing is I'm actually giving the feedback as I'm listening to it. I mean, you can do that or you can do listen and then yeah. um, and give the, so it doesn't have to be. Uh, in 2010, I was brought in by the, um, a colleague of mine at the Department of Education to start something called the Main Arts Assessment Initiative. And it was something I was so proud of because the goal was to get us to look at assessment practices for the purpose of that cycle of feedback, learning, feedback, learning, feedback, learning. Uh, and, and one of the basic tenets that we came up with was make it manageable. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be anything ex extravagant. Make it manageable. Give me 20 seconds. I'm going to assess diction today. That's it. I'm going to assess articulation. I'm going to assess dynamics. That's it. Assess phrasing. Uh, make it 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a student. You can give so much feedback and it takes virtually no time mm -hmm. relative to um, the rest of your day. So cool. anyway. Um, all right, let's jump into the rehearsals. Um, what are some, what are, what's something that you do in rehearsal that is not a trick, but something that is a foundational thing that you do, say an exercise mm -hmm. that we could potentially also use on the band side? Uh, this I came up with about 10 years ago out of a frustration. My students weren't hearing intervals really well. And it was very frustrating that I wasn't developing their ears as well as I wanted. And I was using the literature to develop their ears more than what I wanted it to. I, I mean, I wasn't applying their ear training to the literature so much as the other way around. And, and, and I was, it was one morning while I was getting ready for school, I came up with something I call the reference number. So if my students are singing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, basic scale, they could do that fine. And then I thought to myself, what happens if we change the reference note from one to another note? Mm -hmm. uh, went into school the next day and we tried it. S reference note of three, three, one, three, two, three, 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 four, three, five, three, six, three, seven, three, eight, three, seven, et cetera, and back down. Blew our minds. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do it. They 
They know yeah. one through eight. They they mm -hmm. couldn't do it because what happened was three would start to go flat on the way down, or they would three eight, three seven, three six, three five, three four. They would change three based on what their ear wanted to do, and the discipline analytical the discipline the musical discipline of holding on to three and keeping three in tune while also making the other numbers in tune all of a sudden we were like okay this is what we're going to work on and it's a staple of the program now and the, the students love doing it hmm. they love doing it and it got to a point and we may have even done it in pcc at the time i don't remember if i had done this prior to every week in... you had new stuff <laughs> i didn't remember it all but it was that was what was great is there was always new stuff well this reference number was wonderful because you can change the reference number so if if, if you get three then go to two go to four the tough one of course was sev Sev one, sev two, sev three, sev four. And, and here's the thing. The moment it's out of tune, you don't go on. Like it, it's not good to attempt it. You have to nail it. The point to doing it is to nail it. And so you work on it and you don't, you don't give up. And if it's not tight, then you know what your warm is going to be mm -hmm. for the next rehearsal. How does this per parlay to um, a band? I would love to see what would happen with a band that did the exact same thing. Concert B flat. <laughs> Reference number of three. <laughs> you find out really quickly if they know their fingering. Mm -hmm. Really, sure. really quickly. And it might expose a lot, both for the ensemble, but also for individual students. There's an assessment you can do right there. Play a concert E flat for me. Record it at a metronome of at least this much. Reference number of four. Go. That's your homework assignment. It's due tomorrow night. Turn it in. And you can give them feedback. And when they're doing it, are they changing the tone when they do the skips? Mm -hmm. Are what's their articulation like? And you can give so much feedback. But the thing mm -hmm. is, they also then have to practice that scale other than the traditional one through eight and back down, which really creates facility. So I think that's something that has worked. It's changed my singers. It has yeah. changed my program. My students are wizards with it when it comes to the ear. And it's not because I'm a good teacher. It's because we're working on that all the well, time. You say it's because you say it's because you're not a good teacher. You know but, where I'm going with that. Right. But you isolated something they can't do. And you said, okay, how do I find a way for them to be able to do that? And then you explain as they're doing it, what they're doing that's not correct until they get it. I mean, that's all teaching is, right? Like, I want to figure out what you can't do and help you do that. And the beauty of that, especially, is you're not only to go back to philosophy. What's the philosophy? I want my students to leave being analytical musicians. So if they're doing that, that that is leading towards that big goal. But then it's transferable to their literature. I mean, if they're singing, you know, a two to a sev in a song, that might be problematic. Well, it's going to be problematic. But it's something they've actually practiced before in mm -hmm. my warm-ups. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they've yeah. done it. And we talk about that. If they're struggling with it, we then go back, okay, did we sing that earlier? Yes. Right. We already did that the first 10 minutes of class. So how are we going to approach it in this? So as we're talking about keys, what's, your, what's the best warm-up key? Depends on the ensemble. Okay. It truly depends on the ensemble. So at York, we have, um, I have three different choirs. And... Um, the fun thing, so is it we, based on age or their like where their voice is skill, skill. Th their skill development? And I'll r remind me to point out something about ears in a second if I forget. But the skill development, uh, we have a graduation requirement at York specifically for music, which means you can't get your diploma unless you have passed a half year of music. You don't get a year of fine arts. It's one half year of music, one half year of visual art. The reason I say that is many of the students who sign up for choir are there under duress. They have no desire to sing. Yep. They need their graduation requirement. And so they go in there, you know, like this, and you have exactly one semester to create a choir out of that. Mm -hmm. And it's the most fun you can imagine. <laughs> it's the most fun in the world because what you're doing is you're taking students and simply purely developing skills, mm -hmm. you know, um, back to the choral side of things, the worst disservice that's ever occurred in this country when it comes to choral directing are the TV shows, The Voice and America's Got Talent. 
you know, it's not about talent. It's about skill development. Mm -hmm. It's skill development. And sure. that, and that's what we're after. Uh, so taking those students, um, and developing musicians out of them reinforces the concept, but it's also a ton of fun. How this ties into the earlier question, my warmups for that group, I have basses who have a wonderful ear and a working range of a minor third. <laughs> and if they're singing down here, that means a lot of my warmups are going to be in G. In, or... You got it. Yeah. I have some of my sight readings that I do with them in the key of F. And I just, I, you know, I tell my altos, I lip sync, you know, Millie Vanilli for Sorry. those that re remember the reference, Millie Vanilli for the first couple of beats and we'll get up to your range. Don't push anything. But with treble choir, then I have a whole different series. I intentionally start with C so I can work through the, um, the passaggio and they're flipping from chest voice to head voice. Mm -hmm. In chamber singers, I will literally change the key I'm in all the time. I don't even use the piano. Um, I'm just, okay, let's start on this because they're going to have to sing all over the place anyway. And that's my highest group. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that we have in common, choral directors and, and band directors, is we need to know our ensemble and uh, my big thing with my student teachers is know your audience. And our audience is not the group of people who have congregated to listen to us. Your audience is your class. That's your audience. Know your audience. What are their needs? Not what are your wants as a director? What are their needs? Mm -hmm. Be very specific about what their needs are and then take it from there. So you talked about um, in B flat or E flat or whatever. So one of the things I try to do is as my kids graduate, they're fluent in every key, right? Which means something different vocally than it does musically. In some ways, vocally, different keys are easier because it's just a different key, but it's you have to have your voice fit what that key is. And that's a whole other thing. Instrumentally, it's more about the buttons and the tone that's needed to play in those different keys and recognition of the sharps and things like that. Um, so I tend to go surface level on all the keys and what you're talking about before about making three the the home note or whatever it was you know do i take a month in each key or do i take two months in each key or do i take two weeks in each key like do i want them so that's that's where i struggle i would i would say it comes down to this if you want your students to master their instrument um analogy of I, I use all the time knowing something doesn't mean that you're um, fluent in it mm -hmm. knowing something versus being able to apply it uh when i conducted an msy i i don't use solfege it's for a variety of reasons i've written blog posts on it i'm not anti people who use solfege i just will not use it because i believe we should have a musically literate society and every two-year-old knows what comes after one it's mm -hmm. a language they already know Having said that, uh, if I ever got pushback from MSYM, I'd always say this, okay, raise your hand the moment you know the answer to this question. What is three notes before la? Raise your hand the moment you know. Four, four hands out, 120 immediately go up, and then little, and like, wait, unless your hand immediately went up, you're not functional in solfege, so don't delude yourself. You might know it, yeah. but if you don't know, that you know, three before la is me, then you don't pretend you're functional. And then I say this, okay, what's three before six? <laughs> yeah. We're using numbers. Where I'm going with this is, if you want your students to be functional on their instrument, then having the facility in any given key is gonna be critical. We know we can't do it all with our students that we are working with, whether it's junior high school or high school, yeah. and perhaps even some college programs. We know we can't do it all, so it comes down to what's our hierarchy. And if your choice is to make the scales, that's something that come with time and going to work more on tone, for instance, or articulation, awesome. Then you're not going to spend as much time. If I want my students to be really fluent, however, say a concert B flat, then I'm going to focus on concert B flat and can they do the reference number, you mm -hmm. know? And if they can, pick a number, six, six, one, six, two, six, in that key, then great. Now let's do one through eight in E flat, one through eight in what it, name your key. Mm -hmm. But then you can start playing. If they start getting it nailed down, then you can start playing with your, their ears a lot. Mm -hmm. And like, okay, you think you're so good? Great. Reference number five, go. 
<laughs> you know? And once they have it, then great. You think you're so good? Let's do it at this tempo mm -hmm. on legato. <laughs> I mean, you can play. And the thing for my students, it becomes play. It becomes play. It's a uh, game. Oh, yeah. He, can you trick us or can I, like who's going to win, you or me? Yeah. And, and what it, it really reveals so much when, when they're, they're like, oh, I got this. And then they don't. It's like, oh. <laughs> so, okay, let's get back to, you know, brass tacks. My, I, I guess it has, my answer to you would be, it has less to do with how much time you spend on it than what your goal is for even doing a skill to begin with. Mm -hmm. Do you know your basic fingering? Do you know, you know, that E flat is this, E is this? If you can get that, okay, good, that's foundational. What about its application? Because in the literature you're programming, there's no, there's not one piece of music you're going to program this year, Kyle, that has a chromatic scale, not one song. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> there's no song that they're going to play na, 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 in the literature. There just isn't. So A, can, do I know the notes? Do I know my instrument? And that's, are you being serious? There's no song they're going to have chromatic scale? No, no, no. What I'm saying is, because there is chromatic scale all over the place. What I'm saying is oh. one through eight, in the literature, measure one is bon, da, na, na, oh. na. the next measure, na, 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 yeah. na, not in order. You know, it very rarely. So what about when they have and that happens? If that happens, then that's the exception. My point okay. being that that's 0.02% of what they're going to be doing. The other 99.98% is moving between the notes that are not right next to each other. Mm -hmm. So where I'm going with that, if you, well, let's just use a major scale. If, if all of the music they play, they're playing nothing but one through eight and back down, great, you can play every, every piece. You're not doing that. You're skipping around and you're jumping around. And so then it goes to, in working with my scales, instead of one through eight, how much time do I want to spend? Well, how much time do they need? How much facility is the music requiring of them in this key? And so if you are playing, uh, a song in a specific key, then make that your focal point, but then use your warm ups as an opportunity to test their facility mm -hmm. by using a reference number. So it has less to do, I think, with the amount of time you spend than what are the goals for the song or the songs that I'm doing, and how can my warm up feed into their success mm -hmm. on applying their skills to that song? Which is why choosing great literature is so important. I mean, yeah, I mean, you want to find a good fit for, well, good literature, but also literature that forwards what you want from your students. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's its own thing about uh, common mistakes that we have in choral music and instrumental music, over-programming for a concert. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Because the, our ego is tied up in the level of where our kids play. So if, if we're going to do a grade five, then I'm a good teacher. The but eyes, they the, sound terrible. The eyes are bigger than the stomach. <laughs> yeah. And two, and it goes back to are students here to fulfill the needs of the program or vice versa? You know, and, and I would love, uh, I, there's literature that I love to program with my chamber singers that I feel uh, is, is good collegiate level music, but I program it when I feel like they're ready for it. Um, the December program for my chamber singers, 100% of everything we do for the first semester is acapella. We don't do a single accompanied song. Uh, there's one we do for an alumni song that we come mm -hmm. back on and it's less for the educational than the yeah. opportunity to community. Exactly. Yeah. But their literature that they're learning is all acapella because I want to develop the ear and the literature um, is very specifically selected for that purpose. So, you know, literature is everything. I forget where we went into that, but I just remember that ear thing I wanted to tell you yeah. about earlier. I was going to remind you. I have it here. Ears. <laughs> uh, I had a student. So during COVID, when we weren't allowed to sing, it, it, in many ways, it, become, it became one of the most fulfilling years of my entire career in a really warped kind of way. Because what happened was it removed the concerts, which was the downside, but it also removed the concerts, which was the positive side. We weren't working towards a concert. And we know in education, it shouldn't be about the concert. But invariably, you're going to be working towards a concert. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what can we do that doesn't involve singing, but develops the musicianship? And I spent the entire year working on ear training. 
Um, and one of the pieces of their final exam was a 25 interval. They had to, I, bum, 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 they had to identify the intervals. And it was marvelous. The kids were starting to really hear intervals. We worked on it every single day. And by the end of the year, they had ears of cast iron. Wow. And we talked about, um, you know, why the tritone is difficult here and all that stuff. Um, the, uh, I had two aha moments out of that. I had one student, I had a ton of students do really well on it, but I only had one student get a perfect score out of 25. And these, these are like, you know, minor six, minor sevens that, um, that they had to pick out of there, the tritones. I had only one student, she was a freshman, and her voice was coming along, but the voice wasn't quite there yet, still developing the tone and all that stuff, but she got a perfect score in the ear training. I immediately went down to guidance. I said, this girl needs to be in an honors choir next year. Get her into trouble choir. And give her an oboe. <laughs> and give her, seriously. Got That's her, a, in, yeah. got her, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I had to take it there. <laughs> <laughs> it's warranted. Yeah. And she got into trouble choir. One year in trouble choir, she was in chamber singers. She's going to be a senior this year. She is a beast. And, there, and there's someone who I was not on the radar initially because I, we didn't have a chance to really develop her voice that year, but her ear was amazing. Yeah. And so developing the ear is so core, you know, to what we do. And the other thing, the other aha moment from that was the following year, last year, my chamber singers, I was ready for like, okay, this rebuilding year, musically, we won't, they soared. And I couldn't get over it. They soared. They were drinking in all the literature I was throwing out, all the ear training exercises, they were crushing. And at one point, it was February or March, I literally sat down and I had a chat with them. I said, what's going on? Because normally chamber singers will progress, but you guys are just crushing it. And one of my seniors, Damon Whitcomb, he was one of my kids who joined choir out of duress his freshman year. I was like, oh, this isn't so bad. And then stay with it. He was a senior. He said, Berg, you spent all stinking last year working on your ears. What did you expect? And I was like, oh, right. You mean developing skills is transferable? <laughs> yeah. There it is. There it is. So, um, and that ties in, you know, how much time do you spend as much time as you can mm -hmm. on, on working on those things? I'm yammering on and on at this no, point. No, it's good. So let's, we can't all watch you do a rehearsal. So, but what are some Thank other, <laughs> what are some other, um, things that you do in rehearsal that you, and I'm not making it about you, yeah. but cause you've learned them all from somebody else. And if you made one up, then good for you. That's great. You made something up. Um, what are some other things that we would see in a rehearsal of yours that we might be able to take away and that we could use in our rehearsals? Um, you want to be very specific and I know, um, uh, I know you spoke with uh, uh, Phil Edelman, Dr. Edelman from UMaine, and yep. he, he talked about this, and he was spot on. Uh, keep it simple, but keep it very precise. What are you going after, and why are you going after it, and stick to it. Um, don't go after A, and then maybe B, and then randomly start talking about C, D, and E, which all need attention, but mm -hmm. that's not what you are going after keep it very specific the skills that you're working on in the context of the rehearsal be very precise with your feedback um if if you hear something call them on it be very direct uh i don't think there's really much use in sugarcoating anything i mean there's a difference between being mean and being kind mm -hmm. uh but go after it be very direct one of my one of my heroes in the profession for years has been gary partridge a retired taught down in Connecticut at um, uh, Central, I believe, uh, for years and, and worked um, at Hart. He, um, I watched him conduct early in my, well, holy cow, I'll go to another thing in a second, uh, Kabusa thought, but I watched him uh, rehearse a district festival when I started my career in Vermont. You wanna be a good choral director, watch a good band rehearsal. I spent the entire two days watching him rehearse that band. And I gotta tell you, this band was not prepared. This is rural Vermont, God bless them, but there, there was not as much, the talent pool in rural Vermont is not gonna be the same as Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. It's not. And so the students came in, prepared as well as they could, but they were not up to what he was looking for. 
uh, and he worked them to a pulp, to a pulp. He never once let them forget how he was the lucky one in the room to be able to work with them and never once let them forget that they are there to work. Mm -hmm. And he transformed that band into something. I was in tears at the concert. Well, I think he was in tears at the concert. And it didn't happen from saying, you're okay, I'm okay, let's just do the best we can. It came from, this is, we are here to bring this music back to the intent of the composer, which is a whole different mm -hmm. discussion mm -hmm. to have, but it's related. If our purpose is to bring the ideas of the conductor to life, then, then that's what it's about. It's not about how you feel. It's not about whether you did your homework. That's the goal. And everything feeds into that. Um, going off on that tangent, here's how it's connected. Every single thing he said was connected to what was needed in that moment. And he was very specific and very clear. Clarity and keeping it to one, maybe two things at a time that you want the students to be thinking about and then giving that feedback. So if you have a teacher who's not very good at that, they're, they're, they have a hard time making concise thoughts and being very clear, what are some things you have them think about? So you have a student teacher and you want to help them with that. Um, the, the Bob Russell rule. Uh, Bob was the retired choral director at USM for many years, another hero of mine in the profession. Bob would conduct a choir. He'd stop and there would be some silence while he thought about what he was going to say. And then he'd say one, maybe two sentences and start again and without fail. It was a different choir when he mm. restarted, you know, and, and that is a wonderful model. Now it doesn't have to be exactly that, but the, the process being that I need to give feedback. It has to be precise. So it's okay to have silence. And this is what I tell students, teachers all the time. It is better to have a moment of silence. Matter of fact, there's a lot that's positive about that. It, is the group listening as there's silence or are they talking to each other? Oh, there's silence. I can talk now. Mm -hmm. Separate thing. But think about what you want to say and then say it clearly, crisply, and then go to it. So less words. Try to limit yourself to number of words and say what you want in less words. I, how do you, what about for people, because I'm a believer, especially for dealing with a, a school band, right? They're armed with noisemakers. So that silence if it's not the right culture in the room can be a killer, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, you want to stop a seventh grade band and then give them 10 seconds before you say anything like that's going to go well. Right. Um, so what about how do you, when you're listening to the group, I'm a firm believer. Every time I stop my group, I know what I'm going to address before I stop. Right. I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong, but that's what I've been trained to do. So how do you work through that? If you're somebody who doesn't know, like if you're listening to something, so you have a student teacher and they don't know what they should fix next. How do you know what to go after? Yeah, well, there's two different things going on there in the same question. And the first is the discipline issues are taken care of in warmups if you made that a priority to your program. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you're doing warmups and you um, I had a chance to uh, work with um, someone's concert band a number of years ago and I stopped. And as soon as I stopped, a couple of trumpets faced each other and like, no, you know, if I stop, there's a reason for it. And I was a real jerk for the first mm -hmm. five minutes, but then the rest of rehearsal, it ceased to be an issue. Because there's also a phrase, I'm going to interject, there's a phrase that says, whatever happens in your room, you're giving permission for. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I, I, I have told students, student teachers all the time, only one of two entities can own the room. You or the kids. Mm -hmm. Whose room is it? Mm-hmm. There's no, it's both. I mean, philosophically, we're all in it together. Sure. We know that, but it's either your room or it's their room. And I always say, and choose carefully, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have control over it. And if you can't make that classroom your own, then you have to do some serious looking in the mirror and figure out why, what's going on? Because it's not them. They're just being normal kids. Yeah. You know, that's, as you said, and, that's what and, they do. And the art is... How do I run the room, give permission for everything, but make it about them, not make it about me? Because you could easily turn it into it's the me show as the conductor. And I think a lot of young teachers will do that. And the kids don't buy into that. Oh, no, when it's about no, you, they no. see through it. So how do you how do you make that room atmosphere 
you know, disciplined because you've said it that way, but, but you're just reflecting all the praise and everything on the kids and it's all about them. I came up, uh, and this came out of my mouth talking to one of my student teachers many years ago, and I think I still believe it, that, uh, and the quote was, if your students know that you love them and believe in them as people, but not at the expense of your educational agenda in the classroom, they will in turn love and respect what you do as a teacher. Hmm. That's a good way to put it. And um, one of the cool things that happened during COVID that I've continued since every single rehearsal, I begin five to one with all my students. And this isn't the choral touchy feely thing. Uh, it, 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 it goes well beyond that, I hope, is I begin every rehearsal. I sit in front of my kids, take attendance and say, okay, five to one, how are you today? Five, I'm doing amazing. One, I shouldn't have gotten out of bed. And I just scan the room and it's silent. And I look and I might even ask a couple of the twos, why are you a two today and give them opportunity while I'm tired and, or I was doing this. And the kids are like, I'm all two while well, I had a ton of homework. I had a baseball game last night. I had a baseball yeah. game, whatever. And, um, or I'm a five because my, my cousin, birthday. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And then you find, and so I actually give the first five minutes of rehearsal only to that. It has nothing to do with any educational agenda. I had to do that during COVID. I really had to. Mm -hmm. But then after COVID, I kept doing it and found out it was still really valuable. But it was so neat. Someone who's always a four or a five, and then all of a sudden one day you ask the question and they show a one. It's like, I know to check in with a kid after class. Mm -hmm. And so many of those opportunities that happened on the last couple of years, Kyle, since I kept doing it after COVID. Um, and then we talk about it, we'll debrief. Sometimes it goes into some deeper discussions. Sometimes it's really quick, but then it's like, okay, this is where you're at. This is where I'm at. Um, let's go to work. Yeah. And then I can be a total jerk to them. <laughs> but, but it began with them knowing that I care that much about them, that that was first and foremost. So if, if you're going to have um, control over a room, and making sure it's about acknowledging them as people first and foremost, because that's who they are first mm -hmm. and foremost, sure. but then running that rehearsal. I think the context is everything. Context is as your director, I'm the lucky one, not you. Mm -hmm. I believe that with every choir I've ever been in front of, I'm the lucky one, not you. However, we have a job to do and we're going to do it. And because I'm a good teacher and because I'm a really wise person, I'm not letting you off the hook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if that's the context, no one's going to look at you and think it's about you. How do you teach differently on Friday afternoon than you do on Tuesday mid morning? Like when the kids come in and they're all fives and they're crazy versus, you know, we have, we have an advantage in the band world. I mean, you can't talk and play the oboe. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so how, how do you sort of approach them? Like you'd think all fives is good, but with that might come a lot of energy. Yep. Right. So do you make them kind of conform to what you want to do that day? Or, or do you kind of say, okay, I might, I might alter what I'm doing a little bit or how I do it based on how they're entering the room. Two things about the ensemble. Number one, a mature person, forget musician, a mature young adult, seventh grader, ninth grader, 12th grader is always going to understand that your discipline as a musician is going to prevent you from doing things that get in the way of the ensemble, which includes talking. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a lot of energy, good. Do you have the self-discipline to rein that in? And if you don't, well, today you're going to have a chance to practice it some more. You know, uh, when they're all fives, I tend to be more ornery with my kids. Because they can handle it. They can yeah. handle it. And when they're a one or a two, it's like, okay, let's... Pump them up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and so that's the other the side benefit of the five to one is you really do get a sense of, I said earlier, know your audience. Well, how do you know your audience if, if you're not doing that? And, and so that's the, one of the reasons I'll never stop doing that, by the way. I can sense it as they're, I'm out giving high fives, they're walking in the room. Like, and if you've spent any time around school age kids, for us, it's both high school. Like, okay, I know what this day is going to be. You know, I can do what I was going to do, or I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it in a different way. Well, and, I, and that's what it comes down to is adjusting to your audience. Yeah. If this is my audience today, then I'm certainly going to approach it this way as opposed to I did Tuesday. And that's essential. Going to um, your earlier question with a student teacher who's in front and I hear a dozen things and I have a dozen things that I want to do. Uh, how do I choose which one? Well, okay. A, when I went in, what was my lesson plan? 
mm-hmm. and and then B, where are my kids today? What can they handle? And if they're a one or a two, it's my might be okay. Let's let's work on phrasing, the phrasing in this. Let's work on that because okay, we can get something out of them. If it if they're all fives, then you might say my lesson plan just shifted, and I'm going after bone just bare bone articulation, and I'm going to spend twice as much time on this song as I was on this one because of where they're at. And I know it can do that. What if they're all wearing face paint and costumes because there is a pep rally your eighth period. And, and after that, there's a pep rally. So they're like, the kids are just nuts. Yep. And I say, it's hard to take them seriously when they're wearing a taco costume. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> um, I, I remember I dressed up for Halloween, my senior year in high school, and I dressed up as a ghost. Uh, I had a sheet over my head. Matter of fact, I had, I cut out, my brother had an old Izod shirt yep. that you know the alligator it didn't fit him anymore so i cut out the alligator and and glued it to the ghost so i was a ghost with an izod <laughs> alligator and my band director was so enamored with it that he made me stand up in class that he always made us stand up to do our scales randomly he made me stand up that day um you know, how do you take a ghost seriously well how he did it was he put me on the spot um i i think you can use that to you can use that as a teachable moment with your students and say, guess what? Anyone can focus on a normal day. Let's see how you are today. Because mm-hmm. that's a musician. A musician will focus regardless of the circumstance. And use that as part of your lesson plan. You can stop them 10 minutes and say, no, nope, you're, you're using that as an excuse today. I'm not, no, nope, you're better than that. You're better than that. And if you're not, you're about to be. <laughs> now, and obviously, that doesn't mean that you can't have days where like, okay, we're in, we're in okay. face paint. We're a little more goofy today. We're a little bit more goofy. Then know your audience. And if that's appropriate, then you do that. But it's also a wonderful opportunity to say, no, zig when, you expect them, when they expect you to zag or vice versa. Yeah, sometimes if you can really push them, you can have some of the best rehearsals ever because they're mentally oh, yeah. ready to go. And then they go, oh my gosh, the period's all are already over. You yeah. know, and uh, wow, we just did a great thing. Um, Tom Lazat calls it the three martini lunch. Some people, <laughs> some people not as teachers because that would be illegal. Um, but you know, in the business world, you yeah. know, it's Friday at noon. Well, let's take a long lunch and have three martinis, and we'll kind of let the Friday afternoon kind of go. And then, and then some other people will say, oh, I'm going to have a normal lunch and I'm going to work hard on Friday afternoon because that's going to make it go faster. And before I know it, I'm in the weekend. Yeah. Right. So we can't have any of those three martini lunches. Like if you, if you can get them to work harder and sometimes the period goes more and you get more out of it than you, than you thought you were going to have. One thing I do too, sometimes if they're kind of wild, maybe not wild, but on certain days, maybe once a month I'll have, cause my lesson plans on the board, mm-hmm. right? It's one of these, they right. can see what we're exactly. going to do. Exactly. And especially for band directors, cause percussionists, they have to get out different gear depending oh, on yeah. what, yeah, yeah, unless yeah. it's the, just what's out already. So I might have, you know, usually there's four, three or four or five things that are kind of part of our warm up. I might put in, so they know what books to get out in what order and whatever. But sometimes I'll just have your warm up, and I get to sit there. I just watch them for two minutes. Not that that's enough time to warm up, but and it's amazing the amount of notes they'll play and what they'll do in that warm up. And there's another thing I stole from Jeff Priest, the old wise Jeff Priest. And um, actually, I, I'm wrong. Maybe now I'm old. He stole it from me because I was. I it was one of those days where I had. I said, "You're going to warm up on your own." Now I know in choir you don't warm up on your own, right? Correct. That would be like weird. That's just talking or, or whatever it is. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I was like, my I wanted my band to warm up on their own, but they like they just couldn't. They wouldn't play. It was just like three notes here, four notes there. I was like, mm-hmm. no, I want you to play. So then the next day. We came in. I want to try it again. I put up on the board. I said, I want you to play 1,000 notes before I cut you off. And, and I, I, it worked. It was great, right? So then I told that to Jeff Priest. And Jeff's an experienced teacher, far more experienced than I am. He's like, that's a load of crap. I'm not going to do that. That's the stupidest thing ever. We're the old town band. We're, I don't need to do that, whatever. He did it. He's like, oh, my gosh. I thought they were the Bangor Symphony. You know, these kids who couldn't, you didn't think they'd do anything. They're like playing all these major scales and up and down. And it's like, wow, just because I just let them warm up on their own. And yeah. I told them, I want you to play this many notes. Well, that got them, got them all playing. So that just, well, that speaks to the point of like, A, that's a different kind of day. If you did that every day, okay, they don't have the knowledge to do that every day. Now, if you have professionals, okay, warm up and then we'll start. But, I, but secondly, 
I forgot my second one. Go ahead. So, I mean, th that speaks again to, you know, the, the being analytic, analytical, if we're asking our students to become analytical musicians, are we analytical conductors? Um, eyes. Um, with regard to uh, the work you do as a conductor with regard to uh, tempo. Let's use that as an example. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say that was a great example of one of my favorite quotes. Uh, Lindsey Buckingham, lead singer of um, Fleetwood Mac for years, he, I was watching a documentary on them, and at the very end, he laid this simple, simple quote. I was like, there it is. And he said, if you're any good at all, you know you can be better. Wonderful. There it is. And so if you are being analytical as a director, there's not a single day that goes by in your career, not a single rehearsal that goes by that you're not going to be thinking, okay, what happened and what needs to occur? I'll use eyes as an, as an example. Uh, with the um, singer, and this is another transferable thing to the instrumentalist, if I'm a soloist, the most important thing I have is my voice. Next most important thing is probably my ears, because there's usually a compliment if I'm a soloist, and I need to make sure I'm in time and same dynamic as the accompaniment, whatever. The least important thing I bring to the table as a soloist is uh, my eyes. It's irrelevant, you know, all the time for expression. You sing like yeah, this. It's me. You know? It's about you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. So the eyes are irrelevant. And I say to my students all the time, the problem, we, the challenge of being a choral singer and why being a choral singer is significantly more difficult than being a soloist. People say it's easier. Well, what they mean is they can get away with more. Yep. The reason it's far more difficult is because you have to take that hierarchy and it's flipped upside down. You could be God's gift to the instrumental world. But if you can't watch. If you're not watching, not only are you not helping, you are hindering. Like the band is better off without you. Yep. Better off. And, and so you're really, that's one of your analytical musician things. Am I, am I a soloist or am I an ensemble player? What am I doing in my warm-ups that's developing that eye? And I have a number of choral things that I've developed over the years. That like? Force, well, the no ne no ne na no ne no ne na um, I'll sh There's normal things, and I'll shift tempo all the time. And the moment the students aren't with me, stop. you stop. We don't get to play. It is, yeah. No, no, again. And, and I'll say all the time, are you ahead of me, behind me, or with me? We're behind. Good. Fix Always. it. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, yeah. and, and that's built into the warm-ups. Yep. Uh, I will sometimes think to myself, okay, they're getting it when I'm, they're with me when I'm holding um, regular tempo, but there's a song in compound, and they're just not, not with me. So my next warm up, the next class, I will do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And Some we'll mixed meter. Mixed meter yeah. and compound conducting. And are they able to hold my tempo? Um, when they're not, not if, but when they're not, because we've already established it's, it's mm -hmm. an issue, we talk about, okay, what needs to happen? Um, and, and sometimes you're being, I love telling them, if, if I'm unclear, I'm being paid a lot of money. We talk about teacher salaries being low, but I'm being paid a lot of money to be clear. And so if I'm not being clear, you're not offending me by calling me out. Mm -hmm. Like I have, a, I have one job to do, and that's to be clear. So if I'm not clear, you tell me. But if I am clear, you better be following me. And, and so if I'm not hearing from you that I'm unclear, it's on you. And when you do that, you know, you're opening yourself up for that criticism from the kids. Oh, of course. And that's, that's a great culture builder because that's more about the, the family of all of it. And you, you earn their trust the minute you offer that. Well, and, and I use humor all the time in rehearsal. I cannot tell you the value of humor. Uh, it just, I mean, there's scientific studies how laughing and all that stuff just engages more the, the person, much less the student. But I, my, all my humor is self-depreciating all of it and that also helps the this isn't about me thing mm -hmm. i always when the students aren't watching well, watch ugly watch ugly um my students made me birthday cakes for years happy 188th birthday <laughs> ugly uh, 188 because i was older than dirt and they yeah. all called me ugly because i did it myself well no one is thinking that i'm big-headed when i'm calling myself ugly right it's 
you know, you, there's a lot of different things that you can do with humor, and you're not offending anyone because it's it's on you, not them. Right. But if you are talking about tempo and then like watch ugly, you know, what what am I doing that you're not following? But you also, I know, in one of your episodes, um, I think it was with the Boysens, you were talking about how you were conducting uh, an ensemble, and they were perfectly together but behind you and university of north texas yeah, yeah and you were instead of you know this um and 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 so if if you are being analytical as a director you're always asking yourself what am i doing that can be clear i i got for 15 years uh, graduate level training watching the band directors at msym and it was jeff um it was skeff craig skevington in south portland um one of the highlights of my life, much less my career, was watching Craig for two weeks rehearse and develop um, um, our shadows, um, our yesterdays, length and length shadows. And like shadows. Sam Hazel. Watching him rehearse that and watching it evolve over those two weeks was one of the most amazing things just think about that concept though oh my gosh like obviously as shadows go they get longer oh right well don't but then even... you, you think about your yesterdays and like you you could t you could say everything i know this is a tangent but you could say everything that happened yesterday yeah but last week it would you know you could say a little bit less and they're just they're long and then the further you go the less you remember but like they're just it's just an amazing it's like a reflection piece oh, it's, yeah. a, it's not about the notes but uh, it's a great piece. So it, it, where I was going with that, um, it, you watch all these great conductors, but watch them. I have stolen more of my conducting from instrumentalists, far more than choral directors. Mm -hmm. uh, but the analytical thing about what you're getting and seeing from your ensemble as you conduct, um, in my spring concert last month, I forget what the song was, but um, there is an offbeat that came always, the Mac Wilberg Cindy. Um, um, get along home, little Cindy, get along home, little Cindy. It's one yeah. of those. And uh, in concert, I I normally went like that on the downbeat. You're giving like an ictus. For people yeah. who are not watching, you're giving like a, a strong ictus. Correct. Yeah, sorry, yes, yes. This is also an audio. Yeah. But giving, a, and um, there was one tenor who actually came in, and he hadn't normally done it before. But nerves get, you know, I sure. have a sophomore tenor and chamber singers in sure. front of an audience. Nerves are going to get to them. And he actually came in, uh, and while I was conduct, so I, we have two concerts. Um, we do a revision process between each concert. Hmm. We listen to the concert, do an evaluation by indicator for every single song we do. So we listen to a song and we evaluate the tone, we evaluate the diction, we evaluate the phrasing. Mm -hmm. And the lowest indicator scores they come up with as a class, we have one rehearsal and focus on just those indicators. Then we do the second concert. Super cool. Um, but in the second concert, a week later, we, I, we got to the same spot and we're a few measures before and I'm thinking to myself, oh no, is he going to come in? And so I actually in the moment conducted backwards. Get along, little, little Cindy, get along, home. And I moved my hands back. It was perfect. Matter of fact, I could see the kids like, whoa. And it was spot on. And it, and again, it's not, I'm not, don't consider myself an ex extraordinary conductor. But I think if, you are. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, thank you. You're welcome. It, it's, <laughs> I think it's one of those things that if you're being analytical, you're always looking at what you did. And there was a great example where what I did caused a mistake of one of my musicians. Yeah. And so what am I going to do to fix that? And even in that moment, you, you're always thinking. Um, the ownership, you're taking the extreme ownership that if there's something that happened, yeah. I was the reason. Yeah. And if I'm not the reason, you follow me. But if I am the reason, I need to be analytical enough to think about that. And what is it you know, that I'm going to take from that? So we're going to get into some conducting things, I think, in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you're prepared for that, right? Uh, we'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> um, I, I, we haven't talked much about balance. You know, I think, I know a lot of choirs will, they're in SATB format and then you can mix them up pretty easily. And obviously the more advanced choir that is, the easier that is to do. With the younger kids, you would, I assume you would do that less because they're not ready to hold their own part kind of thing. Um, I'm just wondering how you approach balance in your choirs and how, mm. that, how, how that could be like, so in the band, we talk about pyramid of sound. We, right? I talk about that all the time. Okay. All the time. So you could have, can you have too many men and not enough fem like uh, sopranos. Mm -hmm. Like, could you have four sopranos and 15, 15 basses? Is that a problem? You know what I mean? Like, 
Right. It, is it the same approach? Uh, for me, it is. For me, it absolutely is. Um, and I don't know if this is accurate, but I also learned um, the inversion for jazz. If we're singing more of a jazz piece, I want more of the top end. Yep. Um, for for in a, at least in the choral setting. But the See, um, I never heard of it that way. That's that's super cool. Well, for a cappella jazz. I yeah. think um, for, for that style, that's been helpful for me over the years to use the inversion triangle. But to your question, um, I actually have more basses and tenors and chamber singers this coming year than sopranos and altos for the first time ever. Mm. And I'm really excited about it for the reason you just said. It has to do to some degree with the requirements of the song that you're singing but it also has to do with what are you imposing on the students to achieve the requirements of the song and and i'll i guess what i'm saying by that is for my treble choir this year i had far fewer so treble choirs ones twos and threes ones sopranos threes altos twos are my mezzos numerically i had far fewer threes than i did ones or twos this year um, and just acoustically, it, it, the threes aren't going to be as loud, sure. even if there was the same number of them. Mm -hmm. And so we always had the balance issues. And I had to make some decisions, important ones, about what am I going to do with my threes? Am I going to have them push the sound? Am I going to have them try to create a bigger sound? Because that will fix the balance issue. Or am I going to stick to my guns? This is about training musicians. And if the song doesn't have the balance that I would rather it had, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I really had to talk to myself a lot about that this year. And in the end, if um, you listen to my treble choir, the balance is not great. But I know that I didn't, I did no harm to my threes. Yep. We, we talked all the time about threes. If you have more to give, give it. We talk all the time. We don't talk all the time. We practice all the time in warm ups. Uh, projection, um, breath support. So we could spend an hour just talking about breath support. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the the breath piece. I'm not sure we we talk to our students enough about the technical requirements of um, breathing. Uh, when I would critique, um, I did New Hampshire large group for a number of years. I mean, you knew in five seconds what you were going to hear with a choir when they got on stage, depending on whether you saw, saw their shoulders move and they breathed or not. Yep. You know, are the shoulders moving? Because that's, there's, there's no physical connection. There's nothing in the body that connects the shoulders to the breathing mechanism. Right. None. And so when you're seeing shoulders, you know, that's a symptom of a problem. They don't know how to breathe. They just don't know yeah. how to breathe. And so we, we could talk about we had that. A, we had a, one of the um, airmen of note was doing a clinic, a saxophone player. Um, in local area, and he said he talked about breathing through his wallet. I love so it. So, like when you're sitting down, if, you, if your wallet, like old school, is under under your butt, you breathe kind of through that. And it's kind of funny to say, but when you actually try it, I, I think if people are sitting now, they should try that. Like, breathe in through their wallet, and it's like it expands everything down and out. I had um, a, a former student teacher of mine who taught me so much herself. She's a very accomplished. Uh, voice teacher now and uh jerica olberg she's the choral director in um durham uh um she came up with something called the belt of noses she said take an imaginary belt and on that belt instead of notches there's just noses so belt of tons of noses now put it around your waist and every time you breathe breathe in through all those noses on your belt wow and the kids loved it and it changed. As a matter of fact, I brought it to one of the summer camps I did down in Connecticut. And as a parting gift that week, they made me a belt of noses. Wow. They this huge belt and they bought plastic noses and covered it. And I don't know what happened. I had it for years, but breathing is everything. I'll, I'll have my students lay down on the floor voluntarily. I'm not going to have them lay down on the floor if they're not up for it. But even with my, my welcome back Cotter choir kids, I've had them do this and it's changed where they, I'll have them lay down on the floor and put a book on their stomach yeah. and just breathe. Don't even sing, don't speak, just breathe and watch the book go up and down on your stomach yeah. or feel it go up and down. Now stand up and just have the stomach do the same thing. There's so many different things that we can do to work the, but without the breathing, you know, nothing else 
connects anyway. Where were we going with this? We were talking about balance. Thank you. you. Know, and I know yeah. the comment I wrote down actually has to do more with blend, but so many times we talk about balance and blend being kind of hand, hand in hand, even though they're really not. But to me, it's more about being a, a section performer with somebody next to you. I always have my kids listen on the right side and then listen on the left side and then try to make their sound equal to the people on either side of them. Right. That's more of a blend thing. But well, I think that that ties into tone a lot as well. Yep. It really ties into tone. If I have a tenor singing with a soft palate that's low, e, and a tenor sitting next to him with a soft palate that's high, e, I mean, there's going to be no blend. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that, and that has almost nothing to do with dynamics. It has everything to do with tone. And so we know blend is like this universal word that can actually mean a lot of different things yep. to different people. I don't like using the word blend for that reason. And mm -hmm. I think I'm not alone in that. But what you said is, is great because you know specifically why two kids don't blend. Analytical. Yeah. Right. And I think that's for everything. Same thing. This kid is pr producing a bad sound on the trombone. Why? Is it the equipment? Is it, what are they doing? That, and that's our whole goal as teachers. So here's another thing going back to uh, when you're in front of a band and you want to know what to say. There's only two things you'll encounter as a director, symptoms and problems. That's it. And the art of being an ensemble director is being a, able, A, to identify the difference mm -hmm. and articulate what the problem is. Fix the problem. To fix the symptom. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we get ourselves into a lot of trouble when we start addressing symptoms. Yeah. Because it'll fix it in the moment, but it'll just pop up somewhere else. It's like if you don't drink enough water and you have a raging headache, take ibuprofen. Well, like that's, that's just fixing the symptom. But if you drink more water, that fixes the problem. And, 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 and so going back a while back to, in our conversation, how do you know what to say? Okay, what am I hearing? And are these symptoms or are they problems? More often than not, they're symptoms. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really believe that. Sure. Most of what we hear are symptoms, not problems. And so what's the core issue? And that goes back to, am I addressing those problems so they cease to be problems in my warm-ups? You know? It goes right back to our ensemble rehearsal equals warm-ups plus sheet music. Mm -hmm. And that warm-up has to be able to encompass what the problems would be so that when the symptoms comes, if a symptoms comes up, of they're not following me. That's not a problem. It's a symptom of they're not watching. And we talked about that in warm up. So instead of saying, well, okay, let's try this, you stop and say, what you did in warm ups? Please do that again. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know? Great. All right. What is the purpose of conducting to you? Um, I think as music educators, we wear two hats, for, certainly for the ensembles. Um, there, and I'm going to use a NASCAR analogy. Uh, I love using analogies for my students because sure. it tends to break things down in a, um, a chewable format that they can digest. And the analogy I would use for this is NASCAR. You have your driver and you have the engine mechanic. And it is the function of the engine mechanic to run your rehearsal. It is the function of the driver to conduct. Now, in NASCAR, I wouldn't want my driver working on the engine, and nor would I want my um, engine mechanic driving. I wouldn't want my engine mechanic driving 190 miles per hour in that car. Yeah. I wouldn't, and neither would they, by the way. Yeah. But the irony, of course, in for choral directors and band directors is we are both. Yep. Understand that they're different. Okay, we have to do both, but they are different, radical, radically different needs. If I'm a rehearsal technician, I'm not worried about pattern. I'm not worried about conducting. If I want them, you know, if I'm working on something having to do with eyes, obviously, but, but that's, again, working towards, you know, building the engine. Mm -hmm. um, when you're conducting, you're the race car driver and you are navigating whatever that track requires, navigating whatever traffic is around you as you're going around the curves, navigating, okay, I gotta slow down at this curve or else I'm gonna crash mm -hmm. into that. And I think as a conductor, your role is to navigate the car that someone built for you, in this case, you and your kids, uh, navigate it through the, um, th through the selection that you are performing 
to the degree that the composer at the end of the day would give you a pat on the back and say, well done. Mm -hmm. Not the audience, the composer. I think that is the crucial role of the conductor. Another Robert Shawism uh, that the best thing you can possibly do as a director is get out of the way and let people hear the composer. Um, there's, and, and that's where one of my pet peeves of the choral world sometimes is held is like, well, okay, let's, you know, let's sing with emotion and facial expression, none of which is bad. I mean, Wynton Marsalis is going to play, um, you know, the humble trumpet concerto differently than he's going to play, you know, cool jazz. Yeah. But that's out of, you know, necessity out of what he's playing. He's not trying to create some emotion. It's about the technical requirements. Um, it, it can't be about bringing attention to yourself. It has to be about elevating the composer. Because going back to the literature selection, if you're, if you're about selecting good literature, then let the literature speak for itself. Um, talking about, um, you know, that, that piece that I watched Craig conduct for those two weeks, you know, the beautiful thing about that performance was there wasn't a hint of Craig Skevington in there. And I say that as the highest possible compliment, mm -hmm. highest, because he and his ensemble brought that piece back to life the way the composer would have been proud and say, well done. That has to be the focal point of a conductor is what am I doing to bring this song back to life in the way the composer would have intended, which is really different mm -hmm. than the skill set and requirements of a rehearsal technician. And you're at a summer camp teaching the choirs, and then during your free time, you're sitting and you're watching the band, right? Yeah. So like that, we talk about when you're green, you're growing, when you're ripe, you're rot. Like that's, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Like yeah. you're, it's the middle of the summer, and you're choosing to sit there and watch well, somebody conduct a different type of ensemble. How many people, what percentage of teachers would actually want to do that? Well, and I, I say all the time, whenever anyone is patient enough to listen to me or stupid enough to listen to me, I'll preach this till the, till the day I die, is, is that... You know, and um, I don't know what anyone's taken away from this, but, uh, you know, the fact that, like, okay, I'm doing a band episode, let's, let's bring a choral director, huh? But maybe there's something that can come from something we talked about, if nothing else. Yep. I know that the, going back to you and Crystal not having to audition for PCC, mm -hmm. the ultimate musicians tend to be band directors and orchestra directors. And that's not exclusive. Some of the finest musicians I've ever met are choral directors too. Mm -hmm. But the analytical piece, um, my routine at MSYM, uh, it was the eight o'clock rehearsal, the symphonic band rehearse every day. So I would go get my coffee, walk in, watch the symphonic band rehearse for 50, 55 minutes, go back, get a second coffee, come back in and watch the concert band whole different group of students, different conductor, rehearse for 50, 55 minutes. Then I'd go upstairs into Minsky and rehearse my poor singers for 55 minutes because my brain was exploding. Mm -hmm. And it was a master class for me to experiment with different ideas and things that I would watch in the band rehearsal and say, why won't singers do that? Well, what can I do to bring that to light? And uh, it, it's about growing and learning and being better. Kyle, I, I'm in... I, I say this with humility and I say this in all honesty, I am so much better a conductor in my 50s and a better teacher than I am in my 50s than I ever could have dreamt of being in my 20s, 30s, and 40s. Mm -hmm. and, and I wanted to be able to say that. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, I feel that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but. But I feel like every single year you can grow and build on the year before, which is not dissimilar from being the clarinet player in sixth grade compared to the clarinet player in seventh grade, yep. compared to ninth grade, compared to, you know, being a senior in um, Dr. Edelman's band at UMaine, you know, watching that growth as you get older and as you get wiser, um, it's not about knowing more. It's about seeing more of your drawbacks. Mm -hmm. I, I see more issues in my teaching conducting today than I ever did before, yeah. you know? And so to go back to that, when you're watching others conducting, not in concert as much, but in rehearsal, yeah. what you're listening to the same things they are. And as I'm listening, I'm, I'm playing a game with myself. I'm hearing the same things I think as the conductor on that stage, back to the question of the student teacher, well, how do you know what to hit on? Well, you learn from watching the, watching a great conductor. Mm -hmm. What are they hitting on? If, if I hear these three things, I'm dying for the band to stop so I can see, 
which one of those things is the band director going yep. to hit? I think it's that, but maybe it's this. And sometimes they'd nail it, and I'd be so, yes, yes, that was it. And sometimes they would totally do a 180 on me and go a different way. I'm like, whoa, what just happened? And I'd learn. And the biggest advice I can give people when they're at an honor festival or an all-state or a convention or whatever, watch the groups, can, can watch the groups, whether it be a chorus or band or orchestra, jazz band, watch them rehearse. The amount of people who go and they grade papers and they're talking to their friends and like, I get there's a place for that. And especially if it's in a time of year where you're just like, I finally have four hours with, an, with adults and I want to just, there's a, there's a place for that for sure. But like, watch the groups. If I have an option, this is an overgeneralization, but you'll get where I'm going with this. If I have the opportunity to go to um, a bunch of choral uh, workshops to talk about um, anything having to do with choir, we're spending 10 minutes watching Tony Maiello. Hello. Yeah. I mean, the choir people aren't going to see me all week. <laughs> They're just not. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it's that analytical piece. Try to get inside the head of a really great conductor. What is going on inside their head that they hear? And yeah. what do they see? And what can I learn from that and apply to and, your point? And would you say that the more emotional conductors... I don't know how to phrase this, tend to conduct the music more and the more analytical conductors tend to conduct the pattern and then use the musical elements in, in there. I, I just see, I see choir directors and band directors who just conduct, and I think conducting the music is really important, but literally like conducting all the rhythms rather than conducting the beat and maybe showing, like you talked about, an offbeat rhythm. Um, so like, I know this is a personal thing, but where's that line? I, I, I struggle with, if I'm watching a conductor and I don't know where the time is, mm. that's a problem. Mm. But the, you can also then just conduct beat and that's not a thing either, mm. right? Is, am I, are we on the same page? Like it's kind of a fusing of the two? Um, the, the, the short answer is yes. I, I, I think there is some nuance to that answer, however. I think number one, it goes back to know your audience. I'm going to conduct my Welcome Back Cotter Choir really differently than I can conduct my treble choir. And I'm going to conduct my treble choir really differently than I'm going to conduct chamber singers. Um, there was a concert I conducted, I think it was last year, one of the chamber singer songs, we got to a certain really like amazing point in the music and I knew they had it. And I'd never done this before. While they, while they um, sang the eight measures, I just stood there. I stopped conducting. I just watched them. They crushed it. Because I'm like, they don't need me. I'm out. Yep. You know? And then I was able to come back in that same concert, my choir. I'm like, this is my. <laughs> yep. Be with me. This is beat one. <laughs> you know? And, and, and again, hopefully by that point, they'd been with me. We don't have to do, be doing this. But the point being that um, the nuance is know your audience. And yep. so some of the answers are going to depend on that. But um, okay. if, if you look, use Tony. I mean, um, Peter Bagley was another one, uh, retired um, choral director at UConn, master, master conductor. Uh, when they got into something, I mean, they would bounce. You know, Tony's this way, he'll, he'll start conducting, he'll just jump. Uh, that's not necessarily what you want to be teaching your student teachers, mm -hmm. but he knows his audience. He knows what that song needs, and he knows that this is an extension of himself that he can bring to his performers, to his musicians, that's going to elevate that song yet even more to the degree that he needs for that composer's effect. Mm -hmm. And that's a long-winded way of sort of blending what you're talking about. Right. Robert Shaw was very, Robert Shaw, man, not only could he not sing, I mean, he had the world's worst voice, and that's one of pet peeve, like, if you can't sing, you shouldn't be a music major. Well, I go to my singer with a wonderful ear, the best ear in my entire program as a freshman. You know, she, her voice wasn't developed yet, but amazing musician. Um, Robert Shaw wouldn't be allowed into any music ed program in the United States because he couldn't sing well. There's a problem with that. And as a conductor, I don't think Robert Shaw himself would have said that he was the most amazing conductor. But, the, I mean, Time Magazine in the early 1950s wrote an article on the Robert Shaw Chorale, and it was entitled, Too Much Perfection? Mm -hmm. And he was criticized because it was flawless. 
Well, I don't have to look at any video of him conducting to see his conducting pattern to know that the choir was phenomenal. His conducting wasn't all that. He simply was the engine mechanic that mm -hmm. got that car. And a good NASCAR driver will tell you that a car that's really set up well, you know, you're just, you're basically driving like this the whole time because yep. it's set up well. A car that isn't set up well, you're fighting it the whole way yep. around the course. And, and so it, it, it comes down to so many different factors. But yep. I don't think being a, a, a clear conductor is as important as training your ensemble and aligning with what you're doing as a conductor to what their needs are and the needs of the piece, if, if that's not yeah. a, a weaseling my way out of the question. <laughs> what, what are some of the, when you, without obviously pointing anybody out specifically, but what are some of the things you see in conductors, especially maybe younger conductors, you know, I guess we would call them issues or problems. I would say two things that pop to my mind. One is, um, over conducting, mm -hmm. conducting too big when you don't need it. And, and number two, raising your arms to conduct and continuing to talk, Ooh. giving the mixed message of you put your arms up and then you start talking and then they put their hands there. You put your hands down and then, so that means something. So to me, those things come out, but as you watch other conductors, what are, what are some of those things? Um, the, First of all, great points. The, um, so I wrote down a, a couple of things that I want to make sure I hit, and this is one of the um, common issues in conductors, overconducting for sure. Yeah. Um, Too much a, shoulder, not enough wrist. Yeah, well, and, but I would go back to my choir. I mean, my general choir, if that's what they need, that's what they're going to get. You know, and if four months in, I don't have a year with them. I have four months, and it's the first month or two, they're not even looking at music. I mean, we're just developing skills. I don't pass music out to my chorus until halfway through October yep. um, for first semester chorus. Uh, the, um, I, I wrote down bad habits such as robotic movement and not being analytical. Again, being analytical about why am I doing what I'm doing? The why is more important than the what, going back to a statement that I made at the beginning of all this. If your why is more important than the what, then you will know um, when you're conducting there have been decisions that you've made going into that and not being analytical is i think the biggest issue uh, student it, it's funny as college students it's all about training us to know what to do and as soon as you get into the classroom you then have to do a 180 shift the what you do is not as relevant as the why you're doing it. And that training does not occur necessarily during your four years of college. Sure. And there's not enough time to. I'm not suggesting that there's anything necessarily that can be done about yeah. that. But your mindset at some point has to shift over from am I doing the right thing to why am I doing what I'm doing? Beginning conductors tend to be slow in making that shift. Well, why do I do this? Well, that's what I was taught wrong answer <laughs> mm -hmm. why were you taught it and by the way do you still feel like that's the best approach sure so and, and so that gets into a more of a philosophical answer than a technical one but i think talking about symptoms and problems i think a lot of our conducting or early stage teacher conducting issues are symptoms of that mm -hmm. and um and i think if you get back to brass tacks why am i doing what i'm doing and being in it that can fix a whole lot of hurt in a hurry but just yeah. having those conversations uh, on the band side of things it's about the dynamics to me like like what's the smallest joint in your body well if you think about from shoulder down to like it's yeah but even smaller than that oh you've yeah got, like the oh. final dip, oh. the final oh, portion yeah. of your finger yeah. right yeah so think of the softest your band can play or your choir can sing and can you conduct with your fingernail right can you conduct with the edge of your finger love it yeah and then obviously the louder it is you get to wrist and then you get to What's that? My elbow. <laughs> and, then, and then you get to shoulder, right? But the amount of bands who are supposed to be playing soft says piano or pianissimo and the conductor's using two hands, mirror conducting, and they're using shoulder, right? It's like, so the kids are being told, they're being screamed at visually, mm. but they're not, but they know they're not supposed to be doing that. So to me, if band directors can just conduct the dynamics, thinking about the, the strength that they have within all of their their limbs. Yeah. Uh, going back to Tony, I mean, watching him conduct, uh, he, he, I mean, talk about just technical perf perfection as a conductor. He's it. He's my model. Um, but 
but if he knows he can be getting more out of a group, you know, he'll start jumping in concert, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, why are you doing what you're doing? Um, so one of the things that, and, and I don't want to miss this. So if you don't forget that, but like, I forgot, there's also the baton for people who are using batons too. So like wow. the tip of, like uh, the amount of people I see conduct and the tip of the baton is not the beat. Yeah. They're holding the baton, but their hand yeah. is the beat. Yeah. And the baton is really doing nothing. Yeah. So if you have a baton, make sure like it's doing something and that ictus yeah. is so huge in a way you can practice that is a small, like two inch piece of paper throw it on the end, like to stab it with the, with the baton, right? And then try to flick that off. That's a great way to practice. It's a great that analogy. I haven't heard that analogy before. That is a wonderful one. I would intentionally use a baton earlier in my career. And until, it was really until my 50s, I would use a baton on anything um, that was more classically based. If I'm conducting Mendelssohn or Brahms or something, I always use the baton. And the reason for it was it kept me... Um, on top of things, I had to have the discipline to be that precise, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that precision required uh, is can so easily be lost, but it really keeps you honest as a conductor for the baton. But then when you're not using a baton, same thing. But I also like to think, are you conducting the beat? Or are you conducting the phrase? There's mm -hmm. a lot of, um, and both of those are good answers at different types of different of course, types of music. Of course, of yeah. course. Uh, Shaw used to say that instrumentalists should play more like singers, and singers should sing more like instrumentalists. And uh, if if you are conducting, um, uh, I love conducting shapes. I love conducting phrases. You can't do that unless the tempo is locked in and unless yep. there's some degree of tempo. But I will go back and forth showing tempo between left hand and right hand, depending on what the needs are of, if I'm shaping this, I'll then go into tempo if it's needed here. Uh, I'll go back and forth. And I think there's a lot about that that a lot of conducting teachers would frown upon. Mm -hmm. but that works for me and it works for my ensembles after making that happen. I love conducting shapes as much as I love conducting pulse. And I'm not saying that because I enjoy doing it. I think you can really build a beautiful sense of ensemble if you're conducting a shape, because then you start thinking as a shape as an ensemble too. Mm -hmm. um, and the shape is everything. You know, I, I, I think of tone as being paramount, um, and I think of shape as pretty close to it, an ensemble setting for mm. sure. Uh, if, if the music is, I'll, I'll use all the time that in this particular song, and I'll say especially Brahms, for instance, uh, Mendelssohn to a degree, uh, but there's also some contemporary songs that this works for. I'll say to my students today, here's what I want in this song. Um, I'm not going to conduct shape and I'm not going to conduct dynamic. What I want you to do is every moment you're singing, whether you're changing notes or not, every beat, whether you're changing notes or not, you are getting a little louder or you're getting a little softer and I don't care which. Use your musical intelligence to yep. determine, does this phrase right now, do I feel I should be leaning into the phrase or leaning out? And that's all I want you to do today. I used to do that at MSYM a lot because they had the chops going into it to be able to handle that right off the bat. And some of those things, some of the things they would do was magical yeah some of it didn't work <laughs> but when it worked it was magical and minsky recital hall yeah. anyone who's been in there it's acoustically just to have a choir in there is is immense um and 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 when they're thinking shape and phrase i'm sorry i'm caboosing that thought onto what we're talking about but i think conducting shape and conducting phrase is sometimes at least as important if not more so than holding tempo in time and that's going to look different and, and the purpose and the function is different. Sure. Um, Alan McMurray, I don't know if you recognize that name. He was in for Allstate a couple of years ago. He's one of the top collegiate conductors ever. And he, for his district, not his, for his um, sabbatical, he studied with, I forget the name, but the world's greatest mime. He went to New York <laughs> and literally studied for a whole semester with a mime. And you, you watch him conduct and he'll do things. You're like, wow. Like he is one of the only people I've seen that's more clear than you. I mean, he's like, <laughs> he's so clear. It's like, but he can do, Yeah, he thinks of it like a mime rather than a conductor. I had a- I bet you we could do that on YouTube now, but- Oh my gosh. I, I had a choir that would not shut up when I started my career uh, in Vermont. 
and it was my second year teaching, I guess. And, and I was like, okay, fine, have it your way. And I walked in and I ran the entire rehearsal without speaking. That's not a novel concept. I know yeah. a lot of directors who do it. But uh, the moment I went in and, um, matter of fact, it reminds me of something else I have to tell you. Uh, I went in and I would not talk and they, all of a sudden their engagement was through the roof. They were dead silent. When we stopped, they were like silent because they, what, 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 what's going on? And it worked so well. One of the, um, this was interesting and this isn't a band uh, director issue so much, but it was revealing. Bob Russell was conducting a uh, ensemble, the uh, conductor's choir at one of the Allstates one year. And we were singing in rehearsal and there was something about the song he was rehearsing that I could not, it, it, was, it was weird to me and I couldn't pinpoint why. It was so different, but I was so engaged in what he was doing. And at the end of the song, when we were running it, um, whenever we, when he was ever conducting, it dawned on me what he was doing. He never opened his mouth. Choir directors have sometimes the bad habit of lipping yeah. the, the words and Bob, not once did he open his mouth. I could see his jaw moving on the inside of the mouth. He was, you know, mouthing the words sometimes. But, and what happened was I was so attuned to what he was doing with his hands. And I felt so connected to him as, as a singer. And like, that was brilliant. And after rehearsal, I walked up to him and I said, I have to tell you, that was one of the really amazing experiences I've ever had. I have never worked with a director who didn't even open their mouth and it was brilliant. And I just have to thank you for giving that to us. You know what his response was? I was completely unaware. <laughs> and he awesome. laughed, he, he laughed, but it was, it was an aha moment to me because yeah. I used up literally up until that moment, I was always, okay, you have to help your singers and give them the words. I'm like, dude, why are you doing that? You know? And <laughs> I, I, I've always said, the miraculous thing about bands is that somehow they're able to put on great concerts without giving each other back rubs first. Well, the other <laughs> thing is bands somehow are able to put on great concerts without the band director, you know, lipping the words. Well, there are none. You yeah. don't have to do it. If you're a musician, you're worried yeah. about other things. You might use it as part of it. And we, maybe we can talk now about the, the function of your face as a conductor, oh, but we yeah. talk of, like, sometimes if you want to show them, an O sound, the proper, oh, you might sure. make the, make it and then show like an O with your finger. Right. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. 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 But that's that, different. But, but that is a that's pedagogical. Not that's not mouthing words. Right. That's a pedagogical yeah. approach to now. A problem. If you're, if you're conducting a choir, I, I have to stop you there because I just thought of, um, uh, to, to your question about the, uh, the face I had, uh, a student, um, after one of my concerts, and this wasn't that long ago. This was eight years ago, maybe nine years ago, uh, which for me isn't long ago. But they came up to me um, after, uh, I forget, it was after the concert the next day at school and said, Berg, were you mad at us? I'm like, why would I be mad at you during the concert? He said, you were frowning at us the entire time. I'm like, oh, dude, no, I was just concentrating. He said, oh, thank goodness. A bunch of us were talking afterwards. We thought you were mad at us. And oh my gosh, did I feel like the world's worst teacher? They say that eighty percent of the, the the information somebody takes oh in is gosh. visual. And and so and I hate being fake and I hate being phony and I won't do facial expression to be the kindergarten teacher. I won't do it. However, after that point, I realized I had to do some shifting in how I am. And, and, and so I think I'm a far better engine builder than I am a race car driver. Mm -hmm. um, the irony of you're saying that you think I'm a crystal clear conductor. I'm, I've never been happy with my conducting and, and I feel like I can always be a lot better than what I currently am. And my facial expressions is something that I've really had to focus on and work on hard just to get it to the point where it is today. Yep. And I feel like now I'm finally getting it so it's transferred over to the, okay, I, I can do it without thinking about it box. But for so long, it was in the, I can do it as long as I'm concentrating it on box. Mm -hmm. There were so many concerts. I, I remember I would be conducting concert, conducting away, and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, dude, you're frowning. And then I'm, oh, I'm happy again. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but, 
but that was the worst thing that happened to me and obviously the best thing that happened to me because it revealed a real issue so on the topic of facial expression what are you doing that's um sometimes it's what are you doing that's not detracting mm -hmm. from what you want but certainly there's other points where you know you're you just want to lift a phrase and it's like you nailed it and you're showing that emotion on your face mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong everything right about that and what a wonderful experience to be working under a conductor who's wearing their heart on their sleeve in concert yep. much less rehearsal and and i think the function of the face is really in, really important um perhaps undervalued so you can conduct with your face like, oh I've literally had try it without hands oh i've had student it. teachers do that it's really hard. like they're they they're so focused on you know the undergraduate can i conduct a four pattern yep. conduct a three pattern okay i've had countless student teachers uh conduct with their hands behind their back run the run the song and you're not allowed to use your hands it freaks them out but all of a sudden you see facial expression yep. like crazy yep. and then we have that discussion well okay why why was it there and why wasn't it there when you were using you know your your beat um something that i i wanted to make sure i said is there is a clientele of choir directors who I think mouth the words a lot. And those are the, a lot of them are choir directors who have really young students. Mm -hmm. So imagine you have a first year choir, oh my gosh, say yeah. it's fourth grade or fifth grade or sixth grade. Like, and if you're singing the songs with them to help them feel confident and help them remember what the words are and all that, I think that's a different boat. That's pedagogical. That's called knowing your audience. Rather than, right. you know. Right. No, and that goes, and yeah. that's why I was like earlier. I want to I say said, that because I have friends who might go, oh, wait a minute, I do that all the time. Well, it's like you're teaching super young kids. Well, that's so, a different story. So there were, um, uh, I had a Nick Dozman come in to work with my students in the end of April this year, and he's now leaving to go to California, but he's been the choral director at USM for a number of years here. It's an amazing work. Uh, I had him come on in, and he was gracious enough to spend uh, some time with my students. And I, I treated just, it's a master class. I want you to watch me conduct. And before the kids came in, I said, I said, so I, I'm asking you, um, as one colleague to another, I want you to rake me over the coals with my conducting. I want you to be really hypercritical of me in front of my students. And I want them to see that this is a growth process for all of us. Not, this isn't just for them. Love this that. is for yeah. me too. And his response was priceless. He said, well, which filter do you want me to pass that through? music teacher conducting or music conducting <laughs> and there it is uh we and we had a little conversation about that he said you know there's the needs of what you need as a conductor as a music teacher in the classroom depending on who your students to what you're saying if your audience needs that then you're certainly going to do that and by the way my students generally sing um completely memorized and that doesn't mean there aren't a couple of spots a couple of linchpins that if that linchpin falls out, the rest doesn't happen. Yeah. And I will literally mouth a certain word at a certain point because I know they might need that. But when he said the, how do you want to be evaluated as a conductor? There's music teacher conducting and there's ensemble sure. conducting. And the two are not the same. Yep. And, and sometimes uh, you have to be one and or the other and that's okay. Some it's about, sometimes it's about what the students need at the moment and sometimes it's about what the music needs. Mm -hmm. at the moment yeah yeah um so i'd like to close with some um i don't know if you have any conducting exercises that we could practice right now oh my gosh i don't know if we've done this like obviously you can do like the i haven't practiced so i'm not going to do it but like four four in one hand two four in another hand you know things like that are there any, is there anything you do um or you have your student teachers do to help develop some independence of limbs or or anything else I really I really don't okay. what I what I try to do is take whatever their training has been to that point um and it really has to do with don't grind the gears don't grind the gears if they're coming in with a uh skill set of what of x okay this yep. is their conducting skill set when they walk in we'll build on x let's build yep. on that uh one of the things that I love to do I had um long story won't get into it but one of my choral mentors his name was marv crawford and he had a um his own choir in the 60s and 70s out in michigan uh and i met him as an undergraduate and he took me under his wing he uh and i after i started teaching i would send him recordings of my concerts and say okay please critique me and for for a few years 
he would rake me over the coals. He'd say, Rob, you have not a clue of the long line. He said, you conduct vertically. He, and by the way, I was sending him audio recordings, not, not videos. <laughs> he said, you conduct uh, vertically. He said, you need to discover the horizontal line. And here I am, a 24-year-old. Well, like, what in the world do you mean by that? You know, I'll, I'll conduct horizontally. What? You know, and, and it finally reached me that I was conducting ictus. Uh, and it was always in the same place. It was always up and down. And the moment I moved away from that, it just opened up my conducting. And so I was able to take what I had been trained with and then open it up. I'll have my student teachers all the time, and this is hardly new. Millions of people use it, but conduct like you're underwater. Mm -hmm. Conduct like you're underwater. And can you be precise with your fingernail to use? Can you be that precise underwater? And can you conduct? Um, I've had student teachers where I say, you're not allowed to go up and down. You have to conduct in 4-4 four, four time going side to side, and that's all you're allowed to do. Fake it till you make it. You got to come up with a way to make it happen. But that's your goal right now. Hmm. And all of a sudden, it oh, it just it creates a whole different dimension to their conducting. But I've also had conductors who are just all over the place, and there's no clarity. Um, and that's when I'll have them either use a baton, or uh, I've, I had one student teacher where I put the music stand in front of them, yep. and I said, your ictus has to make a sound on the music stand yep. every time you get there. Perfect. And, and all of a sudden, um, it was more precise than I took the music stand away and had them do the same thing. And the wonderful thing for, for band directors who work with student teachers, uh, the wonderful thing then to do, and this, there has to be a trust level in the room, of course, but then when you've done that with a student teacher, ask the students to give the student teacher feedback. Was it improvement or was it not an improvement? Be honest. And if it was an improvement, why? And allow the students to be their best teacher. So I don't, I, I can't help you on that one. I really don't, I don't practice specific yep. things and, and I don't have my student teachers do, but I look at what their weaknesses are and try to give them exercises that will develop more of those weaker links in their sure. conducting. So is there anything we haven't gotten to? Oh my gosh. Um, that you would like people to have? It's okay if not. Like that, that would be a good end where we had it too. Yeah, I, I'm just looking over, over my notes um, that I want to make sure I hit. And, and I think if we remember and this is a common thread with some other people I know who you've spoken with, is that we're, we're in education and my love of teaching is independent of the discipline I teach. Sure. That's really important to me. I love teaching more than I love music. Um, the irony of my love of choral music is I really don't enjoy singing. I really don't. Sure. Uh, every five years or so, I'll join a choir just to see if I might enjoy it again. And every time, I just do not. I love being a teacher more than I love being a, a musician. And when I remember that, when I walk in my classroom, there's nothing my students can throw at me that I don't, I don't find a total and complete joy. It's sort of like the doctor who lives in a town where no one gets sick. What fun would that be? It's like you want to work with a group that needs to develop. Well, that's your role. And how far they get is secondary. I'll use this analogy that which is more impressive, the student who starts on a 4,000 foot mountain at 3,000 feet and climbs the additional 1,000 to get to 4,000 or the person who starts at the bottom and climbed to 2,000. And I think we live in a society that says, well, the one standing on top of the mountain is the more impressive one. And I would venture to say the ones who travel the farthest, sure, that's where the magic is. And they might only be halfway up the mountain, but they walk 2,000 feet. And that, to me, is the goal of our role in education, is to take our students where they are, bring them as far as they can. And if we've done that, then we've not only done our job, but we've brought a lot of joy to a lot of people. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. 
If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.